That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Royal Hotel, which is the fourth feature, second narrative feature, directed by Kitty Green, which premiered at the Telluride and Toronto Film Festivals before it is being released by Neon on October 6th, 2023. Do I know a Kitty Green movie? No, but her first two docs are pretty damn good. Ukraine is not a brothel and uh, casting Jean Benet. Uh, I also liked her previous feature, The Assistant from 2019, which is about Julia Garner plays the titular person who's working, uh, who's witnessing a Weinstein type event happening to an actor. Oh. Okay, The Royal Hotel. U.S. backpackers Hannah and Liv take a job in a remote Australian pub for some extra cash and are confronted with a bunch of unruly locals in a situation that grows rapidly out of their control. I think it's about you took that description from IMDb. Yeah. It, it's, it says they're American on that description, but several times in the film, it's made clear that they're Canadian. Oh, I thought they were saying they're Canadian as a joke because when Hannah's first approached by that guy in the club... He says, where are you from? And That's she goes, right. Canada. That's right. And then she tells Liv, oh, because people like Canadians more. This is true. So I do think... And that is a ploy that Americans use abroad and what we were told in college to do. Uh, yeah, I've said I'm from Canada too. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, okay. So before I get my pull quote, I think this is a very well done movie. And I think the story is very interesting. My pull quote is, the Royal Hotel succeeds in being one of the most frustrating experiences I've had with a story in a long time. Which sounds good, no? Which is good and bad. I'm left kind of in the middle about it, but I, I could see people really liking this movie. Mm -hmm. What's your pull quote? An anxiety-laden character study about being young, being foolhardy, and being a woman in a drunken, lawless place. The kind where you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. So, Hannah and Liv, they are part of this, like, work and travel program. It sounds like <laughs> hell. What a terrible idea. Uh, but the opening of the film is they, uh, they're in Australia, I think Sydney, and they're partying on a boat, having a gale time, when, I believe it's Liv. Liv's played by... Uh, Jessica Henwick, who is in The Matrix Resurrections and um, The Gray Man. Which is funny, because there's another Matrix alum in this movie. Who's that? Oh, Hugo, Hugo Weaving. Weaving. And then Hannah's played by... Julia Garner. And notably, this is based on a 2016 documentary, Hotel Cool Guardy, which I have not seen. That's right. So, the opening of the film, they're having a gale time, partying on a boat, and Liv goes to buy drinks and her card declines. So she tells Hannah, girl, we ran out of money. Hannah's upset, like, how could this happen? And then we cut to them in some sort of office trying to get more work. And the coordinator says, well, we have a gig over here somewhere in the middle of the outback. It's pretty rural. And you have to get used to male attention. And they go, we'll take it. So we see them go and immediately, like the instant they get picked up, uh, we know that this is going to be some bullshit. So they're in this like pub that has like housing on top of it. It's called the Royal Hotel. It's called the Royal Hotel and it is in the middle of nowhere. And we see that there are two young ladies who were, I guess, doing the same job Liv and Hannah are going to be doing, who are on their way out, these two British ladies. And they get put to work, and the patrons are awful, they're rude, they're um, inappropriate sexually. It just seems like an awful place to work. And then, of course, everyone's drunk out of their minds. But we focus on three men. Well, four if you count the owner. So the okay. owner of the bar is Hugo Weaving, playing a character named Billy. Mm -hmm. And then there's this woman, Carol, Carol, played by... Ursula Jovich, who is in uh, Boz and Lerman's Australia. She seems like she's like Billy's lover slash employee. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Try, then, and also kind of keeping him in line. Yeah, which Try. we'll get to. But the three main male patrons of the bar are Dolly. Mm -hmm. Played by Daniel Henschel, who you to, was the one trying to court S.C. Davis in The Babadook. Oh. And, and he's in Snow the Snowtown Murders. He's terrifying that. So Dolly, then Maddie. Uh-huh. Toby Wallace from Baby Teeth. And then a character named Teeth. Played by James Freshville. So these three men all have eyes on the two ladies, Hannah and Liv. Like, immediately. But Dolly's the most creepy one. And we see that he's hooked up with one of the British girls the night before she leaves. We see him one night drunk. Because the patrons of the bar... They can just walk right upstairs to the rooms these girls are sleeping in. Mm -hmm. So one night we see Dolly kind of drunk and it's kind of creepy. It's very much like Jack Nicholson in The Shining, like approaching their room. But he's not, he knocks, they don't open and it's all good. And then Teeth, who I think they're calling him Teeth because he doesn't have any. 
But um, who's clearly had some head injury. Yeah. But, but is ultimately a sweet person. It seems like. Well, initially. Yeah. But he um, also has eyes for them and is kind of protective of them. But Maddie seems like the most like normal one, mm -hmm. and he actually takes them uh, out to go swimming one day. But. This entire story is about dread. Like, these girls are in danger. There are all these men who are inappropriate, have poor boundaries, aggressive. No one's looking out for them, including the bar owner, Hugo Weaving's character, because he is a an alcoholic derelict. Like, he yeah. really... <laughs> yeah, they meet him at a very bad time because it seems like he has abandoned all hope. So that is what, the like, the dread is. Like, these girls just are not, like, aware of how much danger they're in. Kind of, which we will get to, but everything culminates with a particularly bad evening where um, Dolly's being really rude, and Hugo Weaving has to step in, kind of. Mm -hmm. And Hannah says, "We're done. We're leaving." And he's like, "Oh, you want to quit? Well, you're stuck here for at least two more days because the bus to the the next big city doesn't come until then." But then he's drunk, passes out, and then Carol, his lover manager. She, we need to talk more about it, but she basically, because he owes like some other guy a bunch of money. So Carol takes all the money out of the till mm -hmm. and tells the girls, look, I took the month, like $4,000 to pay this guy. I left a few hundred for y'all. And then she goes, work the next two nights. And, and then the next two nights you can run the bar and whatever money you make, you keep that shit. Mm -hmm. So they do. But then things get real hot because Dolly, we need to talk about Liv and her personality, but she doesn't think Dolly is as bad as Hannah does because the night that Dolly was being real creepy, Liv had passed out from drinking too much. So she thinks he's just a regular dude who's... He's lonely. So he kind of... Dolly like kidnaps Liv, so Hannah has to confront him. She ends up using an axe to bust out his tires, and then he's a, she's able to rescue her friend. So the friend is kind of mad, goes upstairs, falls asleep. Hannah's downstairs getting drunk, passes out. And in the wee hours of the morning, the door, someone's knocking on the bar and it's Maddie, the nice guy. So she opens it. Hannah does. But who's behind Maddie? Dolly. So the two of these fools came back. Dolly convinces Liv to leave. And Maddie's kind of being weird with Hannah. He inadvertently causes her to hit her head, so she's mad. She runs outside, and they kind of all start fighting, when all of a sudden, Teeth pulls up in his truck, rams into Dolly's truck, beats the hell out of Dolly, so essentially rescuing the two girls. But then he comes inside and says he basically did it because he told them that these girls belong to him. Well, Liv in particular. So he's a creep, too, so they kick his ass out. Then they become hysterical because they can't believe what's happened to them. And the final shot of the film is them having set the bar on fire and walking away with all their stuff. Like the left end. eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. What was so frustrating? So I read about the documentary and it's like these two Finnish girls who travel to this pub to work and like, you know, travel. And they interact with all these patrons who are racist, aggressive, inappropriate, all the things, right? And mm -hmm. so it's basically like their experience with that. So this film takes that concept, which I think is really clever, and they add the sense of dread to it. Because these girls are in danger. They're in the middle of nowhere. There's no... There, there will be no police response if they call. I think the one really <clears throat> good moment is there's this pool, and it's the winter season, so they don't realize that it's it's drained. It's dry, it's, it's, yeah. uh, so, But they go sit in their sunbathing in this, this pool, and uh, they hear a woman. Who sounds like she's being assaulted. But they convince themselves, I think she's laughing. Which is kind of, that is the vibe of this film. Like, yes. are you okay? But I think <laughs> that, okay? I, I think I was frustrated, A, because these girls are making decisions that make sense for like young Their people. Age. Yeah, but also super frustrating to witness. <clears throat> but also because everything's so low grade and that sense of dread for my personality, like it's effective up to a point. It's like you're getting me really close, but we never crossed the finish line. So by the end, I felt a little unsatisfied. Like, like I felt like I put through the ringer of being stressed out for these two stupid girls. And then, and then it kind of amounts to nothing. 
but very interesting, very well done. The performances are great. Yeah, Garner's great, but both yeah. both the young women, all are, the guys, are I mean, all the everyone, guys, are really, everyone. It's a really great cast of Australian notables. I mean, James Freshfield, who I don't usually care for, I find him a little bit inert. Um, he was in Animal Kingdom and that that really terrible uh, Anne Fontaine film where Robin Wright and Naomi Watts are sleeping with each other's sons. Oh gosh! A, a, oh yeah, drift. Uh, but he is well cast, I think, for this role. Okay, let me get through these notes. When the two girls get to the place and they see the the, the two British ladies, and they're like clearly hungover, sleeping on the floor, and they, I think it's Hannah asks, like, "What's the Wi-Fi password?" Mm-hmm. And those girls laugh in their faces. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's when I knew we were in trouble. Yeah, like you have no cell service, no Wi-Fi. Well, and Hannah keeps. Um, I think even that very first day, she's like, "I don't want to stay here. I want to go." I think that was also frustrating that because both. They're both like college graduates. They're very smart. And even Hannah, yeah, is like, this is, does not feel right. She says it more than once. So I think what was missing for me is like, we don't know anything about their backgrounds or their friendship, how close they are. Because if that would have been me, like, we're definitely cutting this short. I don't care. Like, I don't know you like that. But, but I think that makes sense because they're both, I think what Hannah realizes is that they really don't know each other that well. But when you're that age and you glow, you're, you, right. you're in a pressure cooker of, you know, say at college, you go, you grow very close, very quickly to people. And that can fool you into believing that you have more in common than you really do. You're right. So it does make sense. But then it's like Liv has issues with alcohol and then she keeps saying like well i was trying to get away from like as far away as i could from where i was so it's like clearly she has some trauma that we don't know anything about then hannah has a really interesting relationship with alcohol that she tries to articulate to someone and it doesn't make any sense see that did make sense to me because she is having an awareness that she can't be out of control and completely vulnerable by drinking too much in certain environments, but she does like to drink. No, her behavior makes sense, but what she says to that person about, well, my, like, well, I don't drink, well, I do drink, well, my mom used to drink, but she knew how to drink not too much, so you know. It was just all very, like, it's it, all hinting, it, like, this it, entire movie's hinting at everything, and it just kind of, I wanted something to be, like, solid. But to me, that makes very much ten- sense for someone that's in denial about their parents' behavior that they've also You're right. uh, kind of learned from, that they don't, when you don't want to admit that this is a problem. Yes. I, you're, you're right. It does make sense. I'm just saying that everything about the story is like that. Everything's sure. vague. Even, like, so, when Carol takes Billy, Hugo Weaving's character, she basically says, like, come on, throws him in the car with some of her stuff and says, like, we're leaving. I'm going to take him to rehab and then I'm moving on. So they basically abandon their bar to go to rehab. But before that happens, he kind of is disrespectful to her. So it's like, I don't understand these two's relationship enough to understand why Carol didn't just grab that money and leave. Like, why would you bother with him? She feels indebted to him, I guess, for some reason. Sure. But yes, how the whites... Uh, treat the indigenous I think is very subtly there are racial undertones are racial undertones racist sure. undertones you know. um, Carol is miserable the minute we meet her she's the one who picks up Hannah and Liv and she doesn't say anything she's really gruff she does warm up to them a little bit but I interpreted that as like as a woman in that environment who has had to learn how to adapt mm-hmm. she's just really tough and you get these young white foreign girls that come in there and, you know, do this. Uh, they all kind of end up doing the same thing, getting drunk and, you know, sleeping with the locals. When Maddie takes the girls to go swimming, he's driving like to the middle of the outback, like where there is no water. So that was creepy. Again, like I'm nervous. And then we find out that he's actually taking them to an actual spring. But while they're driving, he wants to play some music. And he's like, oh, have you heard of Kylie Minogue? <laughs> It's and cute. he starts playing the locomotion. Out of all the Kylie songs. Out of all the, yeah, this like straight, this dirty straight boy loves locomotion. Okay. I thought that was a cute scene. Or maybe I thought he was trying to like appeal to them, like these girls might like it. Mm-hmm. Either way, it was cute. It's cute, but it leads up to a moment that's kind of on the vibe of uh, George Sluzer's The Vanishing. Like, what's going to happen to Yes, you? and then I thought, you couldn't pay me to jump in that water. Because one of them says, well, should we make sure it's safe? And he's like... He laughs. And yeah. he throws them into the water. Like, absolutely not. Oh, and the snakes in the jars at the bar? So then that's an important scene. Well, there are snakes in the jar at the bar, but an important scene is um, Hannah is, like, really scared of Dolly at this point. And then this huge snake appears in their bedroom. 
and I'm sure it was poisonous. And so of course they freak out. And this is after Dolly's been kicked out of the bar, but he's still lingering. He's lingering. He's lingering like Treat Williams and Smooth Talk, like right at the periphery. Like you gotta let me in. Yeah, it's creepy. But he goes, "You need some help," and they're like, "Yeah, there's a snake." So we see him grab the snake but with his bare hands like nothing and then later we see that he's also put it in a jar but the other snakes in a jar are little like preserves and then this snake is huge it looks like it's in like a five gallon glass dr drum and he preserves it puts it on the bar top and puts hannah's name on mm -hmm, it like so, a, as a tribute to so of her. course she's freaked out mm -hmm. um, i think there are weird metaphorical undertones with that too teeth when Teeth runs into Dolly's uh, truck to beat him up at the end, that's not the first time Teeth runs into something because earlier in the film, Teeth asks Liv out on a date and she he gets embarrassed because everyone's like, oh, hell no. Like, she's not going to go out with you. So he's upset. He drives off and he rams into, because Hugo Weaving and his partner manager live in like a mobile home in front of the bar. Yeah, like literally like, you walk outside and you see it. Oh, can you imagine? No, I would Ugh. not be there. No. Not for me. I think this would make a great double feature with Ted Kotcheff's Wake and Fright uh, from 1971 starring Donald Pleasance, which is all about these uh, uh, this Wild West drunken Australian men. Uh, like there's a very famous scene with a punching out a kangaroo, but it, feel, it feels very much like this out of control world that's really scary. Well, but like mid, like it's it's a mild version because it's like it's not that out of control and it's not that scary. So that's I think why I was kind of frustrated. It's, it's scary if you're not getting drunk, because everybody that gets drunk kind of becomes part of this this mess of uh, cross boundaries. Like like if you look at Liv versus Hannah and Hannah, who's trying to maintain a sense of control, that the one who's terrified is her. Yeah, I think anyone who's worked in an environment where people get drunk, which I have, I think you relate to like, there's always this sense of tension. Like when people have been drinking, they snap, right? You don't know what they might do. And then do. because you're a service worker, it's like, well, I can't snap back. So it's like, you learn how to manage difficult people who aren't thinking clearly. That So I guess maybe because I'm so accustomed to that, that it was more annoying to me, like, that wh why are they here? Why are they staying there uncomfortable? I don't know why Liv is so... But you took time to learn that as a, as a young person in sure, the environment. Sure, sure. That, that, that's, that's what it feels like. They don't right. really know how to how how to say no, how to be assertive, how to stand up for themselves. Because that whole scene that's really tense with Dolly yeah. uh, trying to challenge her, trying to challenge Julia Garner's Hannah, you know, you can see her... She's in over her head and she doesn't know how... Yeah. She hasn't learned how to effectively challenge someone like that. It's very effective. Yeah. Uh, so the guy in the opening of the film on the boat who Hannah was like kissing on. Oh, yeah, yeah. He mm -hmm. ends up making an appearance at the end of the film, towards the end of the film, because she had called him to say, come pick me up. So he drives the hours in a little red Fiat blasting EDM. Torsten Herbert Nordrum, who's in the film The Worst Person in the World, which you haven't seen, but he's one of the lovers in that. He's, he's really good in that, too. I didn't need him. He was fine. He was cute. The, he's fine, but I don't think I needed that character... In, in this story it just well seemed... I, I think it's interesting because he shows a sense of salvation and also a but then he ends up being a creep as well also but also a person she's met in a similar way in, mo in a more glamorous space right uh that kind of starts uh, what she sours on him because because uh he starts calling her the the local nickname she's earned he uses the C word, yeah. see you next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And and it's used more than once. And we see Hannah really react mm -hmm. negatively to that word, which I thought was very interesting. Um, what I took from this film when it was finished is like these two young ladies um, are like, but I think many people can relate to it. I think even being like a younger gay person going into a gay space and like feeling like, you're under attack, like people want to get at you. But in this movie, these two young women, they are not safe. Like they have to watch their back. Like you have to watch your back when you're like a desirable thing relative to the space, right? Because mm -hmm. we all could feel like that depending on the environment we're in. And it's like, you have to be aware. And when you're not accustomed to that or you're too naive or you're immature. Naive, you're innocent. You know? or, or innocent, that's where the fear comes in. As, as someone who knows what's up watching it, it's like, that's why I use the word frustrating. Not because, like, again, it's very well done. So it, my score reflects me feeling very in the middle about it because mm -hmm. I was very frustrated by it. Sure. But I could 
if, if you gave it a much higher score, it would make sense to me. What would you give this movie? Uh, three. Oh, I would give it two and a half out of five. <laughs> so... Okay. You try to champion this thing, you only give it half, Cha- a, half a star more than I did. <laughs> anyway, anything else? No. Hit the thanks button, listen to our podcast. Bye. Oh, <laughs>